Oregon is demure and lovely. And it ought to play a little hard to get. The overriding challenge, the umbrella issue of the decade in Oregon is quality, quality of life in Oregon. We talked a lot about what Tom McCall did as governor as we drove over to Eastern Oregon that morning. As we traveled, it seemed to us that this is where the Tom McCall story begins. A story about a man who loved his state and its people. And they loved him, too. A lesson for America, perhaps. As you travel to the place where Tom McCall was raised, you begin to think about the things he did as governor, cleaning up polluted rivers, making energy conservation a part of our daily lives, advocating planning in the interest of sensible growth in the face of inevitable growth. And you think of the really unusual things he did as a political leader, throwing a rock concert for the youngsters at a time when people were saying, shoot the damn kids, or making a speech advocating death with dignity. You can miss the McCall place if you're not looking. No neon signs here. And driving over the old wooden creaky bridges can be a nerve-wracking experience. This visit to the ranch was, well, different. The family gathered here because Mother Dorothy McCall had passed away. And everyone met for the funeral and memorial service. <laughs> nice to see you. Good to see Thank you. Let me bring your chair. Oh, it's too heavy, I'll get... Of course they were saddened by their loss, but Mother McCall had lived a long life, and the end was quick, in her own apartment, not drawn out over months of agonizing pain in some impersonal home for the elderly. It eased their pain, and of course, old friends were on hand to lend their support. Charlie, they were giving all the awards, and this man kept kissing all the women who won the awards. About three men got awards, and they didn't, they weren't kissed by this. Remember that? Yeah. Charlie got up and said, I believe in the ERA. Kiss them all. <laughs> <laughs> we shared a weekend with a unique family and learned more about the influences their lifestyle had on a man, a governor, a leader unique among them all. And perhaps much of the credit for the character, the style of these people, belongs with Mother Dorothy McCall, the vibrant, intelligent, warm matriarch who instilled so many values in her family. Oliver Cromwell's letters and speeches with elucidations by Thomas Carlyle. How would you like to rip through that when you're 12? This lasted at least two hours every night. And uh, it, was, it was a real form of entertainment. It sure as a heck beats a lot of uh, television. And we wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't have been governor. My brother wouldn't have been an outstanding lawyer. The other brother who's dead wouldn't have been an outstanding professor. And my sisters wouldn't have the grace they have. It hadn't been for that session every night. Mother McCall's hand and heart prints are all over her kids even now. But her love for her children never prevented the hand from overruling the heart when childhood and sins I, like playing hooky from school to go to a movie were committed. At home, I got home about 10.30 and they dropped me off and I could see the lights on in the hall I could see in the window and I walked into the hall and here was Mother with a loaded quirt, slapping it against her hip, walking back and forth. And she said, drop your pants. And she lashed me with that quirt, loaded quirt, full of lead. She just made my legs just covered with, with welts in my bottom. And she said, now, don't ever forget the difference between going to school and and the unimportant things that compete with it. They had a real nice ceremony for Dorothy McCall that weekend. 
she ended up beside the only man she ever loved, her husband Hal, who had died after the big war. Remarry? No, not Dorothy. And she explained she never remarried because when you've had grade A for so many years, why settle for grade B? After the service, the family and friends gathered back at the ranch for a big feed and stories about Mother McCall. She was a woman of balance. Of course, you had to learn, but you should play and have fun, too, like in the big room upstairs. The toys were sitting quietly in the afternoon sun, probably thinking about Dorothy and all the fun they used to have with the kids. Part of the fun of this place was life itself, the challenges, like the kids playing in a dance band and making real money or printing up their own newspaper and with guidance learning to appreciate the difference between fact and fiction when presenting a chronicle of the latest news. All the barns and pigsties had addresses and every uh, little tizzy of a fight that mother and dad had we'd report in great detail. <laughs> and it was uh, so popular back east that my Aunt Marion sent me a check for $50. The whole group three of us, Babs and Harry and I put it out, she said for uh, past pleasures and to underwrite future enjoyment. And so that's the most money we've seen in a long time. So it immediately shut down the presses, <laughs> terminated publication. <laughs> and I went, went to town, bought a lot of goodies with the $50. That, that was that. <laughs> Tom McCall became a professional journalist, first as a newspaper man, later as a radio and TV reporter and commentator. All the McCall kids carried the lessons their mother taught them so well, accepting responsibility, meeting challenges. As a journalist, it seemed to Tom McCall that protecting Oregon's environment was a responsible challenge. For openers, he decided it was time to clean up a 270-mile-long open sewer known as the Willamette River. Part of these wastes are concentrated and burned, but most of them are diluted and dispersed in the rivers and streams, making the pulp and paper industry the largest contributor of organic waste to the water of Oregon. Where these wastes are not treated in a safe manner, the affluent becomes an oxygen-gulping, slime-making scourge. It destroys fish life. It fouls fishing gear and fishing boats. Sometimes it churns at river's bottom, forming into rafts that rise to the surface as sluggish, foul-smelling masses of film. McCall took the message to TV viewers in a national award-winning documentary, Pollution in Paradise. Tom Dargan was the program director at Portland television station KGW at the time. People just don't remember the awful and, uh, excuse me, but chicken guts uh, being dumped into the uh, Willamette River. The uh, raw sewage just pouring out of uh, pipes, you know, huge pipes. Uh, couldn't swim in it and fish couldn't live in it. That's right. In fact, you'd uh, look in the Malamba River and fish would be going belly up, uh, floating down, including carp that can uh, live in, you know, very poorly oxygenated uh, water. McCall's documentary led to anti-pollution laws being approved by the Oregon legislature. The process of cleaning up the Willamette began to move forward, slowly, but forward. Tom McCall's interest in public affairs issues helped lead to his entry into politics. He became Secretary of State in 1964. In 1966, he won the race for governor. As governor, McCall appointed himself chairman of the state sanitary authority, making sure there was no buck passing on the Willamette cleanup. That was a great citizen effort. I just arrived in time to say, let's crash through. We're on the 10-yard line. Let's go over the goal line. In 1964, 66 salmon were counted at the Oregon City Fish Ladder. By 1974, 35,000 salmon journeyed through the facility. But today there are renewed fears about pollution in the Willamette River because there are more people here now, and the government says it doesn't have enough money for advanced sewer and water treatment systems. My admonition that day was always, okay, we're going to rest on our laurels, we're going to have a big party now, but tomorrow morning, we're going to have to start working just as hard 
to keep clean what we've already cleaned up. You'd be hard pressed to find anyone opposed to the cleanup of the Willamette. But another major environmental accomplishment of the McCall years has, over the last decade, spawned an army of opponents. Ironically, McCall himself believes the complainers may have some valid points in their criticism of land use planning. day people come to Oregon just to look things over. The scenic ribbon of water snaking quickly through the arid canyon. The natural spine of mountains, sometimes clustered together like families, quietly watching the land and people below. The awesome beauty of the gorge created in the violent tantrum of an earth in its infancy. The Oregon coast, where the water and seabirds play a constant haunting symphony. But people were doing more than just enjoying the view while Tom McCall was governor. They were saying, nope, I'll never leave. This is where I want to live. Now, no one ever suggested people are bad. That's absurd. But people require things. Clean air, clean water, places to live, places to work, places to play. And almost without noticing, people can take over the natural resources which stand in their way. So Tom McCall worried. Because without timber, and without farmland, and without rivers clean enough for fish, Oregon would, well, not be Oregon. It would become something else. Half-jokingly, he suggested to a convention that they enjoy the visit, but don't, for heaven's sake, move here to live. What? The whole point was, it was just a cautionary finger. And the whole thing in my mind was that you, you think about the carrying capacity of your state. I mean, how you can have as many people there as the state can carry in terms of a balance between its economy and its ecology. That's uh, it just that you don't knee-jerk into the position of all growth, crazy growth, stinking growth, or knee-jerk into the position that we're going to all live in tree houses and uh, eat grass. The visit but don't stay remark made news all over the world, but apparently the message was lost somewhere because people and businesses kept moving in. Payrolls and personal incomes jumped. Oregon became the sixth fastest growing state in America. And to cope with this, McCall convinced the state to take a radical step, implement land use planning. It keeps ranchettes and uh, communities and everything else from cutting into the timber base of the state. Likewise, it keeps, uh, uh, you know, just snap developments on the spur of the moment from ripping into farmland and most precious farmland and contributing to urban sprawl, which is self-defeating because you build away from the center of your infrastructure, your pipes and your streets and so on, your schools, and it costs 55% more to develop. So there are some enlightened developers from out of state who appreciate the fact that we do indeed have a system that is more workable and less hit and miss for having development sites and protecting them and making uh, investment from out of state really welcome, not just lip service welcome. Getting land use through the legislature was not easy, but it had tremendous appeal with those who rely upon natural resources the state's four major industries, tourism, fishing, timber, and agriculture, were among its strongest supporters. Not surprising then that a dairy farmer from the Willamette Valley named Hector McPherson was a state senator crucial to the bill's passage. I was very much concerned about the preservation of farmland. Uh, I live in a rural area and, and I saw the, the folks moving out from town and, and wanting to surround me out here and, and it would be uh, extremely difficult to keep on a dairy operation with, with people like that around me. And so I got very involved in land use planning. So when I got to the legislature, then I decided that something more needed to be done than had been done from the state level to, uh, to get a program that would fit not only my needs but those of the rest of the farmland around the state. 
And while land use planning was popular with a lot of rural folks, like the farmers, it also picked up support from the city slickers, like State Senator Ted Halleck. It was a chance to, to um, um, innovate, I saw that. It was a chance really to protect agricultural land, I saw that. And that was Tom. He saw what land use planning was when I was being the mechanic in producing it, but didn't understand all the nuances myself. And Hector McPherson understood it from the standpoint of being a farmer, which he was. That's the, that's the McCall. He's a big picture man. Land use planning is under sharp attack. Its critics say it is at least slowing economic growth, hurting Oregon's image with business, that the LCDC is a bureaucracy, insensitive and unfair to the people. The former director of LCDC is L.B. Day. He says he too is disappointed in the agency. I think we've been, uh, the state, and particularly LCDC, has been too strident in holding to uh, uh, what they think is the perfect land use plan instead of uh, admitting that every plan has warts. That if we only have a 95% effective land use plan, isn't that a lot better than arousing the troops to the point that they knock out the whole works? Holding out for the perfect plan, I think, has created a lot of, uh, of uh, controversy, more than is necessary, and I think it's lost a lot of support for land use. And I think land use is extremely important to the state. It's just a mockery because the localities haven't gone to their comprehensive plans in an incisive way. We have this mess where industry's hung up trying to get sites. I think that's unfortunate because we named it the Land Conservation and Development Commission. It was intended <clears throat> to uh, really order and control growth, not to stop it. And uh, uh, I think that we've seen uh, the uh, slowing down process or the lack of decision making or the fact that when decisions are made, they're constantly appealed. Oregon is arguing with itself now about the wisdom of land use planning in general, Land Conservation and Development Commission in particular. Even Tom McCall cautions and counsels land use planning's strongest advocates not to go too far. I'm an advisor to a thousand friends of Oregon, which is the only single purpose, public interest law firm in the United States, single purpose is that it takes care of one bill, which is Senate Bill 100. And I've said often to Henry Richmond, the director, I said, Henry, we've got to allow the exercise of a certain amount of schlock, which is in everybody's mind and heart and personality. My reaction to him was, we do. <laughs> Quite a bit. <laughs> Oregon may never quit arguing with itself over land use planning. But in November of 1982, the voters will be asked, not if the agency's powers should be limited or modified, but whether or not Oregon should abolish the Land Conservation and Development Commission. You don't have to be very old to remember taking bottles back to the store for deposit money. The kids used to pay for a lot of Saturday movies and popcorn with the money they'd get. But a funny thing happened. The people who manufacture all kinds of drinks decided Americans should just throw the containers away instead of returning them. Well, by the late 1960s, Oregon legislators were talking about a return to returnables. Legislation that would include deposits on both beer and soft drink containers, while at the same time outlawing pull tabs on cans. At first, Tom McCall opposed the bill, though not vigorously. However, by 1971, Tom McCall became one of the bill's strongest advocates. Then came the thought, that if you had throwaways, you being the brewers, you being the pop bottlers, you wouldn't have to be responsible for the logistics of taking these bottles back and sending them and washing them. And therefore, you could grow bigger and bigger. You wouldn't have to have your presence in every region or every state or every town to handle the bottles. So the ultimate of that would be, Paul, that you would have one brewery maybe in the center of the United States and one pop bottler and you'd bombard the United States with 400 billion cans and bottles a year with no responsibility. At the height of the campaign to get the bottle bill approved, businessman John Passantini offered a half a penny for every container returned to his convenience stores. Our stores were buried with containers and there was no way for customers to get into our parking lots. 
and he called the National Guard out to pick up the containers. A lot of people objected to the fact that he would have the National Guard help us, but he felt that he didn't care the heck with it. They were, he was going to do it anyway and let them sue if they want. They lost 36,000 jobs. They lost more than, oh, two, three quarters of the uh, breweries in the United States. They cut down the mom and pop bottlers, the most ruthless attack on small business in history. And yet they cried when we wanted to bring in the bottle bill. Oh, think what's going to happen to jobs. Oregon's then Attorney General, Lee Johnson, says the bottle bill's opponents helped get the bill passed. They had no conception of attitudes in Oregon. And, uh, uh, and they, they tried to use a lot of, of uh, arm-twisting techniques that just do not uh, get it anywhere, uh, just create an opposite reaction. The night before the Senate vote, I was offered the bribe of $5,000 by a now-deceased uh, lobbyist for organized labor who was, a, who was uh, uh, representing, uh, to me, uh, the Glass Institute or whatever the hell it was. When I debated the bottle bill less than three years ago in front of the Cleveland City Club, the vice president of the Continental Can Company turned on me and said, don't you ever foist the Luddite ways of the people of Oregon on the people of Ohio. And he was a native of Ohio as he booed in his own state. Since the passage, though, Tom McCall has single-handedly, not single-handedly, but together with Hatfield and other people, helped that bill from being defamed nationally, which was the whole purpose of the Glass Institute and these other guys who want to knock it in the head, and has tried to carry the message to other states not very successfully, which, which I don't understand, as we haven't been able to do in land use planning. One of the main uh, reasons we're penalized in the boardrooms of corporations that like to badmouth us is the bottle bill. There's not as much litter along Oregon's roads and highways since they passed the bottle bill. It saves energy. It creates jobs. Now, as we mentioned, Oregonians are still debating the wisdom of land use planning, but they tend to tell pollsters they support the returnable concept by more than 90% margins. Because of Tom McCall's in-person testimony, some other states have adopted bottle bills. But Congress, under intense pressure from the same folks who battled Oregon's bottle bill, have been using their profits and political powers to block similar federal legislation. Apparently the decision was made that, okay, we'll go on the basis that if it works in Oregon, by God, it won't work anywhere else. Why, do you know what they are up there? They're nothing but a bunch of, a bunch of woodsy weirdos. That's what they say about Oregon. That's what I've had spread at me. Up until they decided to have you buy gas on the odd-even plan, back during the Arab oil embargo, you could sit in a two-block-long line for hours just to buy gas. A guy who worked for Tom McCall came up with an idea one night. You would buy gas on either odd or even-numbered days, depending upon the last digit of your license plate. Daryl Butis worked in the Department of Human Resources. He remembers what McCall did when presented with the idea. A fellow named Don Jarvie who happened to say, uh, you know, kind of a after, after one evening's meeting, you know, why don't we do it like, uh, like the water, you know, odd even by license plate. The next morning, it, you know, it was the McCall plan. He was on the way, he was selling. You know, here's the idea, great idea, let's go sell it, and it helped solve a problem. Uh, he wasn't afraid to take something that was, a, that was an idea and run with it. After a meeting with McCall, gas station dealers agreed to give the odd even plan a try. But some of them were worried. They were afraid the federal government would object to the plan. McCall told the gas dealers to send anyone who complained to him. No one complained. In fact, the entire nation followed Oregon's lead and implemented the odd even plan. Almost overnight, the fist fights and the long lines at gas pumps disappeared. In a normal year, there's lots of water behind the Columbia River dams which generate electricity for this place. But one year, there was this electrical energy shortage because it didn't rain in Oregon. Droughts happen here about, oh, every hundred years or so. No one could remember what Oregon did the last time there was a drought. Tom McCall faced a once-in-a-century challenge. He tried to figure out a way to get the folks to conserve energy, really drive the point home. So he announced, in typical McCall fashion, he was assuming emergency powers 
and ordering all unnecessary outdoor ad lights turned out. Portland sure looked different at night. It was a lot darker, but Oregon was saving energy, and most folks cooperated. After all, the order came from Tom McCall. The reason it wasn't attacked, everybody was going to brandish their lawyers at us, and then they just thought that it was so much in the public interest, who dare stand up? against the governor with this kind of backing and where there is the possibility of an energy emergency. Tom McCall was one of the nation's first and most vocal advocates for conservation and renewable energy development. But west of Portland sits the Trojan nuclear plant, the only one in Oregon built while Tom McCall was governor. I don't uh, regard it as a work of art, but just use it, I say, use it as sparingly as you possibly can so you don't get oversubscribed, so you don't become uh, uh, apathetic, you see, about forging ahead with all the options. You could talk for hours about Tom McCall's environmental and energy accomplishments, and the record would stand today as a model of balance, ordering state employees to save energy six months before the federal government implemented a similar plan protecting and guaranteeing the public's access to beaches in Oregon. And while McCall could and did get tough with industrial polluters, he also insisted that state government help industries solve problems. His understanding of the need for balance extended beyond environment and energy, though. Tom McCall was a people's governor, first and last. And trying to resolve people problems presented him with some of his greatest challenges. Tom McCall did more than raise hell over the government's decision to ship in a load of nerve gas to Oregon from Okinawa. He got the public into the fight with him, and boy, did they fight, sending letters, signing petitions. The Nixon administration soon got the message to stick the nerve gas somewhere else. Tom McCall understood his people because he listened to them. But sometimes his ideas for solving problems even left his supporters gasping. Like when the American Legion decided to hold its big convention in Portland, and young folks from all over America decided to drop in just to let the Legionnaires know that not everyone supported the Vietnam War. While the potential for violence was as real as it was frightening, Tom McCall didn't want Portland, Oregon to become synonymous with Kent State. Maybe the best idea would be to get the kids, you know, out of town or diverted someplace else. Like maybe throwing a rock concert. This was Vortex, the state-sanctioned and supported rock festival held at McIver State Park, about a half hour's drive from Portland and the Legion Convention. The idea came from McCall's executive assistant, Ed Westerdahl. We came up with a pretty radical approach, uh, which was called Vortex One, but uh, in essence, a legalized hip, uh, pot party. Uh, that was in the final days of Tom's campaign for governor. Probably came close to hysterics, you know, just to, what an impossible, implausible, what, you know, Western all are you crazy, you know? But he was also convinced it was the right thing to do to keep Portland from becoming a battleground. The death Tom McCall's staff, including press aide Ron Schmidt, supported Vortex, but Schmidt also told McCall, throw a rock concert and you'll probably lose the re-election campaign. He had a swivel chair and he swiveled around with his back to us and he just kind of looked up for a minute. Uh, we were all waiting for the response, swivel back and said, I have just made my decision. I have just committed political suicide. We're going to have Vortex. Just finally came to the conclusion that handling this right would incidentally be good politics. And handling it wrong, <coughs> because you were too timid and you were shading toward what was safe and conventional and useless probably. We were thoroughly prepared to arrest substantial numbers of people uh, and, uh, and to deal with them uh, in a very uh, uh, strict fashion. And we made that known to them and I, I th we got back by the grapevine that we got our message across. So, it was a combination of both the 
carrot and the stick that succeeded there. Tom McCall once joked that he wished he could build a fence around Oregon and keep both the protesters and the Legionnaires out. One of the organizers of the rock concert, Craig Berkman, remembers McCall's dilemma. The real issue was, could you have legitimate protest without violence in the 1970s, given the backdrop of what was happening at Kent State and Cambodia and the national political climate? The young folks had a great time at the rock concert. Some anti-war protesters were in Portland, but there was no violence, except for one broken window, damage estimate, $40. Tom McCall was re-elected two months later. The American Legion supported the peace with honor approach to ending the Vietnam War. It was a war Tom McCall believed America should never have become involved in, but he would not take a negative stand on the issue. Tom McCall's son, Tad, was an ensign in the Navy serving in Vietnam. Do you think I'd be at home cutting my son down, his purpose down? God, I'd be a traitor to my own family and, in a sense, to all the people over there. The governor's staff to an individual were adamantly against our stand as far as administration in Vietnam. It was probably the one issue, more than anything else that I can recall, that was as volatile in split that staff, because we were very close personally. If you could have more popped out of it overnight, every soldier, sailor, and Marine in the Air Force was fine. Because I knew we were just plowing a field that was going to raise nothing but uh, weeds and crosses. As you know, I've just returned from an Asian tour during which I visited many countries, including Vietnam and Korea. One reason a lot of people worried about violence at the Legion Convention was the presence of this man, Vice President Spiro Agnew. McCall believed Agnew's speeches were negative, destructive, dividing, not uniting America. He was particularly angry when Agnew began attacking politicians who wouldn't be yes-men for Richard Nixon. The day that Wally Hickel quit, the Secretary of the Interior, the press asked me my reaction, and I said, I think the president is getting ready for his 1972 campaign. He's pairing his uh, official family. He's going to look at his staff. And I wouldn't be surprised if he would take a hard second look at that man who's running around the country with a knife in his shawl. Ron Schmidt went with Tom McCall a few weeks later to a Western Governor's yeah, Conference, where Vice President Agnew gave a speech. He heard the Vice President of the United States uh, make a rotten, bigoted little speech. And that's all it was. It really dripped with venom. McCall's executive assistant, Bob Davis. He was making some comments about, uh, well, uh, we could do without uh, people uh, being so negative, uh, governors uh, running around doing, uh, being critical. Former New Mexico governor David Cargo. And along in the middle of it, why I leaned over and I said, Tom, the vice president asked me to personally appeal to you uh, not to make any adverse comments on the speech. And Tom said, oh, that's fine, 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 fine. Ron Schmidt says everyone soon realized Agnew's speech was really an attack on Tom McCall. He actually could not believe what he was hearing. Quick looked over and he said, is that SLB saying what I think he's saying? And I said, you're listening to him, knowing Tom's reaction as I did. I knew exactly what he would do. He left the dinner. He walked outside. I remember it was outside the lodge and it was snowing. And he started stomping around <laughs> in the snow. I said, I'm so mad. I, I can't conceive that he said what he said. Uh, some of the press came up afterwards and said, Governor, what's your reaction to the Vice President? And I found Tom just coming in from the back uh, veranda uh, and the television lights going off, and he obviously had made a statement. I rushed up and I said, Tom, uh, uh, now this is a time to be cool. I understand you did, didn't like that speech. I didn't like it, but it's a time to be cool. Let's be statesmanlike about it. And he said, well, 
Bob, that's going to be a little hard to do, he said, when I just called it a dirty, bigoted, bitter little speech. <laughs> and so uh, I agreed with that. He looked at it from the standpoint that here was, was the number two man in the United States. Quite candidly, probably the number two man in the world. Uh, being mean, being vindictive, giving the most hated speech that probably the governors in the United States had ever heard. And only one governor spoke out against this uh, because they were all Republicans and didn't want to uh, affront the administration. I knew when I said that the wind was roaring in my ears that I was embarking. I was embarking maybe on a fateful voyage from which I might not return. The Republicans were pretty mad at Tom McCall for attacking Spiro Agnew. A few years later, they were enraged when he suggested Richard Nixon do the country a favor and resign as president because of Watergate. McCall was never a big Nixon supporter, and he was suspicious about why the governor of California was such a loyal Nixonite. On the basis of uh, what California wanted, in terms of what it deserved in relation to the federal government, it was extracting a lot more money uh, than it was entitled to on the basis of equality with the other states. And it was checked by reporters, and well, it was well, true. Well, Jack Anderson had a column about uh, five months later. He said, it was, to the tune, the disproportion was to the tune of $600 million that California was getting, simply because they just wanted the federal government I wanted to keep on the good side of California because if Nixon couldn't hold on to California, if he had an enemy in Reagan, then he wasn't going to be president again. We tried to interview President Reagan. Instead, we got this nice note. It says, quoting, Governor McCall and I had a good and friendly relationship when I was governor of California. Later adding, he had a good grasp of the problems peculiar to the West. It isn't just some Tom McCall versus Ronald Reagan vendetta. He's a peach of a neighbor, and he used to have his driver in his car take me around when I was in California, my wife. But he, he, he nothing, he proposed his works. But Tom McCall wanted Oregon government to work. He convinced lawmakers to approve his reorganization plan because he understood you cannot run government by committee. The government reorganization plan improved efficiency and saved taxpayers money. The first director of the Department of Human Resources, Jacob Tanzer. It was a real innovation in state government, and it was a real demonstration that government programs could be coordinated and that they could be oriented to how people actually lived and to the accomplishment of real objectives, not just throwing the money in, but trying to do something, trying to accomplish something. To, in fact, get people in many cases, off ADC. Absolutely, off, to off. Get, get people off welfare or to prevent elderly people, for example, from slipping into greater dependence or nursing homes, enable them to stay in their homes. It, it worked both ways. Neil Goldschmidt was considered a progressive politician, sort of like Tom McCall. He was Portland's mayor. He represents not just a progressive spirit in government, but a sense of belief that the government is, is in the public's ex entitled to expect it produce something, that it do something. The bottle bills and all of these things are his way of getting a jump on the, on the world he sees coming at, at Oregon. And, and he's a guy who feels Oregon in his stomach. He took on uh, difficult issues at very awkward political times. I mean, you know, you look at the American Legion situation and you look at uh, the state's supported rock concert during a campaign. I mean, if he was concerned about, about votes, he wouldn't have done that. He never looked for a way to avoid an issue or avoid taking a position. As many very responsible uh, and very successful uh, government officials have. He talked to people, never talked at them. Uh, he tried to inform and not persuade. Many times I would talk to him about the fact that uh, Maybe this isn't something that the, the state of Oregon or the governor of the state can do anything about. It may be bigger than both of us. Uh, and his response usually to that was, well, we can try. And more often than not, he was right. We can do anything. Give us a challenge. You want to clean up the beaches? OK, we'll do that. You want to you clean up the air? OK, how about the river? Sure, let's do that too. 
we did it. And so there was an attitude about, give us a challenge, we'll overcome it. Senator Ted Halleck was visiting uh, to visiting him to discuss some program, and the noise level became uh, very high, so high that I was concerned that they were having a, 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 not only an argument, but a fight. And I, so I jumped up to run into the office to try to be the peacemaker, and I found they were agreeing with each other. The, the, here are two people with tremendous energies that uh, uh, were having uh, so much fun agreeing uh, that they were screaming. We should, and if we could tackle more of our problems this way, we'd solve more instead of we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't. And that's what, but his weakness was he didn't have every dollar figure needle, neatly in place and every hair neatly parted for you know, the bureaucracy when he'd advocate this idea or that. Tom McCall's tax reform plan was complicated. He'd answer one question, they'd ask him five more. He personally campaigned for the proposal, which called for the state to pick up 90% of school operating costs, coupled with a lid on expenditures. Something like that is tremendously hard to create, almost impossible to pass, and yet uh, so easy to attack. That's what makes you sad. We invested 15 months of our lives in that, working as hard as we could. It also was the only significant fiscal, I won't call it reform, but fiscal plan in my 20 years in the legislature. Hatfield once came out for a simple tax program, whatever the hell it was, to get 64 million bucks. Uh, Tom had a plan geared to local governments and school district perpetuations and so forth. And it just would have assured a high level of education all across the state. It, it was very sad, but it was so intriguing that we were asked to present it by HEW in Washington to about 600 people, state leaders and, and tax people. And the judgment of, of those people was that it, it was inordinately hard to pass in a referendum, initiative referendum state. But if the legislature passed it, if the people could have experienced a year under it, or a couple of years, then they certainly would have been in love with it. McCall was with longtime friend Clay Myers the night voters rejected his tax plan and talked about resigning. It's as close as I've ever seen him to uh, becoming emotionally uh, destroyed as far as his relationship with people, because Tom is a people person. He loves people, and he felt that it was such a good plan that there was no way it could be rejected. He felt unworthy. He thought, the people are telling me that I'm not a leader. And somebody, this is so important, we ought to get somebody in here to lead it, because this needs to be done. Tom McCall did not resign. Education financing is still a problem in Oregon. Some schools have even closed, because voters say they can't afford higher property taxes. <laughs> Despite the tax plan defeat, the public's opinion of McCall was on the rise. Maybe it's hard to dislike a politician who's upfront and open about where he wants to lead you. He had real vision, and he saw government as an instrument toward accomplishing those visions. Uh, government was not a uh, beast to be feared. Uh, government was rather an instrument in the hands of human beings to improve their to improve their world and to do the things that people couldn't do by themselves. No matter where he went, whether it's in a store buying his wife a Christmas present, he'd take an aide along because he'd be too busy talking to people to, to, to buy the president. You know, he, he, he didn't, the people wouldn't let him take the time to do his own, his own thing. McCall staff member, Marco Haggard. He was one of the few role models for his period of what's best in politics in the United States. Of course, we had some horrible models at that time. <laughs> he really didn't want a lot of yes people around him. He was uncomfortable with that and uh, was much more comfortable with a divergence of opinion. He spoke his mind. He spoke it openly. He spoke it without a great deal of political restraint. I've seen him on many occasions openly admit publicly that uh, he felt the decision he made was wrong. He was reversing it. Here are the reasons why. And get, he got on to another uh, problem. So. I think it was a, a very warm working relationship, and it was, uh, uh, frankly, uh, most people that served during that time uh, found it enjoyable. I think he had a lot of, uh, it was a lot of fun at the same time, uh, a lot of hard work. Despite Tom McCall's best efforts, sometimes government couldn't help people. 
like the time state budgets had to be cut. A woman with a heart condition told Tom McCall she was going to lose a subsidy for a telephone, which she needed to stay in contact with her doctor. The governor immediately uh, demanded uh, and ordered a revocation of the order. Uh, we explained to him and continued to argue with him that uh, you couldn't do that. Uh, you could not terminate a, uh, an order uh, which was part of a budget process on, on one case. I remember so well, uh, Tom was sitting at the head of this long table with a staff of maybe 15 or 20 sitting around, and uh, when it finally, we finally prevailed and made him understand that we could not change that order, uh, he said, well, and reached in his pocket, and, and he never carried much money, reached in his pocket and said, well, let's take up a collection then so we can pay for a phone, and so we did every month thereafter uh, until the budget crunch was over and she had her telephone. It was his own personal commitment that, that made him both great and in some instances less effective. Too human. He was too human. Um, and I, I think you need a thicker skin than, than Tom had. And he would be hurt a lot by some comments that would be made by other individuals. The State Capitol News Corps was well aware that Tom McCall was human. He used to hang around the press room. He described himself as a journalist on loan to government, and his staff never did break him of the habit of leaking stories to the media. The co-author of McCall's autobiography, Steve Neal. Because he was like them, and they, they saw him as a guy who uh, could tell a good story and knew what was going on, and, and most of all, you know, liked to have a good time. He liked them, and, and they liked, liked him. They would say, tell us about it, Tom. I said, well, I think Ron's going to put out something tomorrow, but here's how I view it. And then, then he'd come upstairs and come into my office, and he said, you know, I ran into some press guys, and they really are interested about this, this little story that we well, talked I'm about just five minutes ago. Mm -hmm. uh, he was marvelous. Really, the quickest way to uh, get something, I think, out to the public, we used to joke, was to uh, tell Tom not to say anything about it. But what's government all about? You know, shouldn't there be absolute communication between the chief executive officer of the state of Oregon and his board of directors, the people? Maybe I was too accommodative of the press too often. And people said, do you have regular press conferences? I didn't have regular press conferences because I lived with the press day and night. <laughs> Life was an internal, <laughs> incessant Wand press conference. Wandered into the press room, as Ron Schmidt would tell us, and spill what had gone on in the staff <laughs> meeting. <laughs> I kept a few things back. I can't, Name two. I can't rip <laughs> Name two. <laughs> oh, don't push me now. <laughs> If a governor has to be protected, or if any politician has to be protected by a press secretary, then basically that man or that woman should not be in office. They threw a big bash for Tom McCall when he stepped down after eight years as governor of Oregon, roasting and toasting, teasing and praising him for the things he had said and done. McCall had had a prostate cancer operation while still governor. That, too, was reported by the media in graphic, some said too graphic, detail. But that's the kind of guy he was, all up front. And he was at the height of his popularity, but he decided not to run for another office, like the U.S. Senate, although polls showed he would have won. Instead, four years later, in 1978, he decided he wanted to be governor again. And the main reason, let me tell you, that the people who love me don't want me to run or didn't want me to run is they knew with that kind of standing that they'd have to make me, the opponents would have to turn me into a hamburger to defeat me. He ran as a Republican, which surprised the political junkies who expected him to run as an independent. After all, Tom McCall had advocated an independent third force in American politics because he was afraid the bile-like stench of Watergate was destroying America's faith in government. But no, he decided to run as a Republican. He lost the primary campaign, and on election night, failed to concede to or endorse the winner. 
Tom McCall was bitter over his defeat by Victor Atia. I want you to know that I ran the campaign as well as I could, and I did yeah, not, yeah. as you know, never take any shots. But we ran the thing. We ran as all the little mind feels that you and Roger laid that I was a preacher of the 1960s, you know, that I was an I-5 candidate. Yeah, we, oh, yes. I didn't. No, well, that's okay. There's no use bickering. You apparently have a sufficient number of votes to win the Republican primary. How many? Which is about 8% of the votes in the state of Oregon. Good luck to you. But even today, staunch supporters like Ted Halleck say they'd tell him to do it again, even though they know now he would lose. We didn't do this as an exercise to resuscitate the ghost of Tom McCall, to, to just put our hero up and have him shot down to mix my metaphors. We did this to give Oregon back the greatest goddamn governor it's ever had. The defeat marked the end of his political career. But Tom McCall's political record will stand as a legacy for future generations to study. Today, the legacy and the man are facing new challenges. Things have changed since Tom McCall was Oregon's governor. The family has the ranch up for sale, hoping the new owner will refurbish the grand old place. Tom McCall continues his battle with cancer, facing the inevitable with typical philosophical curiosity. You're terminal the minute you arrive. You've been going to go ever since you got here. Still, it is, it's unacceptable when the calendar hints that the prospect has lost its open-endedness. Despair strikes you when what was always vaguely inevitable is barely down the road anymore. But despite the physical pain, Tom McCall still comes to work writing and taping his daily commentary for television. He's a pioneer in this field, but he's still your working newsman facing the grind of the daily deadline. And his desk, well, it looks like you'd expect a newsman's desk to look. It epitomizes organization and class. There's a beautiful plateau above the Columbia River, east of Portland, where fragile wildflowers live with many animal and bird species. It's called Rowena Plateau, it's been purchased for protection and preservation by the Nature Conservancy. The park was dedicated in honor of Tom McCall, a man who understands the need to protect and preserve the special places in a special place called Oregon. But people are leaving the special place called Oregon because there's a shortage of jobs. Housing starts have dropped. The timber industry has laid off thousands of employees. There's a big push now to get businesses from other states to locate here. But Oregon's environmental laws, its tax structure, and Tom McCall's visit but don't stay remark are all seen as reasons why out-of-state industries won't come here. You see, it wasn't a no-growth thing. This is, uh, naturally, that's alarming. And what I found out is it's hard to interpret in the average mind what I was trying to say. So I always said all along it was a dangerous thing to do. Mm -hmm. It was just on the face of it. You were taking a tremendous risk playing games with Western hospitality. Which Thus is, the... Yeah, yeah, which is equatable with God, motherhood, and the golden arches, was the way I used to put it. Recently, state officials decided to eliminate the words we hope you will enjoy your visit from the road sign at the Oregon-California border. The sign now reads, Welcome to Oregon. Tom McCall participated in the ceremony. Well, sort of. There's been a lot of bad mouthing about visit but don't stay. It uh, served its purpose. We were saying visit but don't stay because Oregon queen bee, though she is, is not yet ready for the swarm. And I think you'll all be just as sick as I am if we find it. There's nothing but a hungry hussy throwing herself at every stinking smokestack that's offered.
Tom McCall hasn't surrendered his basic commitment to preservation and protection of Oregon's natural resources. He doesn't want to see the place trashed. He knows you don't grow trees in parking lots. You can't raise crops on housing developments. Fish can't survive in polluted waters. Humans can't breathe filthy air and remain healthy. Tom McCall's critics can enjoy the luxury and safety of perfect rearview vision. But that's fair, because Tom McCall understands nothing is perfect. Modifications and changes to many programs may be necessary. But Tom McCall's commitment was to a balance between a healthy economy and a clean environment. And without that balance, Oregon won't be a nice place to live. It won't even be a nice place to visit.